Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 51 of the weekly playback. It was a super busy week. Um, I had to go to a law conference for two days, so I missed my typical game night. So I only played one game in the last week and I've only received two games. So it might be a short video, who knows, we'll see. So the one game I got to play in the last week was Dog Park. So I don't know if you guys watched my last video where I actually showed this game um, because it was a new arrival and I kept on, you know, showing this other thing and I thought it was a poster. It turns out it's actually a board game sleeve, which makes a lot more sense than it being a poster since it did have creases in it. And yeah, so it'll keep your board game. And it's actually good for this game because I feel like there's a bit of lift in the cover when you have everything in it. And I haven't even sleeved these cards because there's a ton of cards, so it would be too much to sleeve, I feel like. Um, so yeah, so the sleeve helps keep it really tight and nice together. And if you store your board games vertically, then that's definitely helpful. So the information. So Dog Park is a 2022 game for one to four players designed by Lottie Hazel and Jack Hazel and illustrated by Kate Avery, Holly Exley, Dan May and published by Birdwood Games. I played a four player game of this and I have the collector's edition, which I backed on Kickstarter. Um, so in this game, you are collecting dogs and taking them for walks. <laughs> so let me just show you the board and then I'll throw up a picture which will hopefully explain things better. Um, so in this game, you are going to have, in, there's going to be uh, four rounds and in four rounds, you're going to be able to collect two dogs per round and then take decide which dogs you want to take for a walk and I'll explain that here. Each person is going to have a dog marker starting on space five which is the number of points you start with and then you can spend points which I'll get to in a minute. You're going to have breed expert dog cards here so if you are the person with the most dogs of a certain breed by the end of the game you'll get the points that are next to it as indicated and those are just randomly uh, placed. You're going to have your dog uh, walking person here and you're you're going to be going for a walk either this way or you can go this way and you end here for your leaving bonus uh, this is where the dogs will be and then you have your I think they're called park cards or something like that which are like special conditions for the current round that you're in so each player is going to have a kennel and in your kennel is where you're going to place all the dogs dogs that you collect these are component holders um, and then below your kennel, each person is going to have this like other board, which is the, the, I don't remember what it's called, but this is where you place your dogs that you're taking for a walk. And you can only take a maximum of three dogs for a walk um, in a round. Um, and you have to pay their walking cost and different dogs will have different costs. So when you, at the beginning of a round, you're basically bidding on dogs. Um, so let me just show you. So uh, there's different kinds of dogs in this game. And so you're going to reveal some dogs and uh, you are going to have this and what you're bidding on dogs are actually points. So you can bid a maximum of five on a certain dog. And if, you, if you're the first in the round, then you would get to place your uh, leash first underneath that dog because order matters in case multiple people bid on a certain dog. And then if you win that dog, you decrease the amount you bid uh, in your points. So you're spending points to bid on various dogs. And again, you know, different, it's like kind of like an engine building game. So you want to, you know, try to collect different dogs, which will pair together nicely and, you know, allow you to maximize your points. And you might also be trying to get those breed expert points, which I had referenced before. So let me just show you those cards. So yeah, so these are shuffled and randomly placed at the side of the board. So if you have the most of a certain kind of breed at the end, you will get the points associated with that. Oh, and then the forecast cards. Um, those are the cards which will tell you what happens in a round. Um, oh, and then there's location bonuses. Um, I forgot about those. So yeah, in, um, in the beginning of each round, you're going to reveal a card which will tell you what's something extra you place on each location. So when you're walking, if you land on a certain location, then uh, with the bonus on it, you'll also get the bonus. So each round has a new location bonus as well for the walking path. Um, so yes, yeah, so you're going to take turns bidding on dogs. And then after everyone has two dogs, then you will pay to take a dog on a walk and you will pay in the resources shown. And everyone starts with a certain number of resources. Um, so like some dogs require bones and toys, some require like two toys and a stick. So you're just going to pay what is required to walk a dog. And then dogs have certain walking abilities or 
um, end of game final scoring abilities or even selection abilities. Like so for this one, this one says during selection when you place this dog on the lead, gain a stick. So if you during selection place this dog, you will get a stick. So and this one is like during final scoring, gain one point for each leftover ball assigned to this dog, maximum six. So at the end of the game, you can assign any balls to this dog and you'll gain points for it. Um, and some of them have walking abilities. So this one says when walking this dog, whenever you gain one or more bone, you may do a special action, which I'll discuss in a minute. So this happens during movement and you can activate it once per movement. And so the way movement works is starting with the starting player, you're going to go up to four spaces. So you can only move up to four spaces uh, on the walking path, which again, I'll show you. And if you land on the same space as someone else, then you lose a point, I believe it was. So yeah, so you're, everyone is going to be starting here and you're going to be moving one to four spaces. Some dogs allow you to avoid paying the penalty if you have that dog on your lead. Um, so yeah, and you're going to be getting the resources or action that you land on and then you're getting to the end. So you can choose which space you want to, like in a four player game, you would choose which space you want to land on. Because if you take the top space, you'll get three points. But if you take the third space, you'll get one point plus be able to do the special action here. And if you're the last one to leave the park, you get minus one point. And it's kind of like the game Parks, if you've ever played Parks. If everyone has reached the end of the track, you don't get to keep on going as many spaces as you want because that would prolong the game. So it's not like you can just move one space and get every single resource that is before you. You would basically get one more turn and have to reach the end. Um, so yeah, so let me just pull out the rule book because that discussed the penalty, which I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was one point. Um, so yeah. And the, oh, and those actions. So if you land on, there are certain actions that you can take. Actually, I'll just pull out this card here. So one action which shows like that dog, that's a swapping ability. So you can exchange one dog from your kennel with a dog in the field. And then there's a scout ability, which is really helpful. So you may reveal the top two cards of the deck and you may replace a dog in the field, which is where you're selecting dogs from and bidding on dogs from, uh, with one of the dogs drawn remove unselected cards from the game. So that's helpful if you are trying to collect a certain number of dogs from a certain breed in order to get the breed bonus at the end for having the most of a certain kind of dog. So you may want to switch dogs from the deck in the field so that hopefully you can try to get that dog later. Um, yeah, um, let me just look at the other card. So yeah, so we have the recruitment phase and then the selection phase. So the selection phase is when you decide which dogs you're going to walk and place them in your lead, on your lead rather. Um, so that's when you take dogs from your kennel and place them down here and pay the cost in order to walk those dogs. And then you add a leash token to them. So each dog that is walked will have a leash token placed on it. And at the end of a round, if you have a dog without a leash token on it in your kennel, you're going to lose points. So you'll lose one point for each dog in your kennel without a leash. So if you've had a dog in your kennel for like two rounds that you were never able to walk, that's minus two points already. So you want to try to walk every dog at least once and ideally in the round that you get that dog so you don't lose points. Um, so yeah, so you'll go walking. So first you have recruitment where everyone recruits two dogs. Um, and then you have selection where you decide which dogs you're going to walk up to three. Then you actually go walking. And then after everyone has left the park and gotten their bonuses or minus point if you're the last one, then you have home time. So you gain two points for each dog on your lead. So for each dog you had on your lead, you'll gain two points. And then minus one point for each dog in your kennel your kennel without a lead, um, without a collar, sorry, collar token. And then you're going to flip the current forecast card and start again. Um, so it's four rounds. It went by very quickly, I feel like. You know, it's one of those games where I wish that there had been more rounds, but then if there were more rounds, I feel like, yeah, maybe no matter how many rounds there are, I would always feel like I need more. Like I could still keep on doing more. But yeah, it was a really good game. I really enjoyed it. So the end scores we had, I came in last place with 29 points 
and then someone had 33, then 37, and 40. So pretty close together, I would say, the scores were. Um, unfortunately, the dogs I was collecting were not the high scoring ones for breed expert points. Um, I got my most points from final scoring abilities. So I had some dogs with final scoring abilities and I got most of my points from that. Um, the winner, um, let's see. Oh, and of course you get the points that you end on on the park board. That's, you know, also points that you'll get. Um, you'll also get points from your, so you'll, you'll get points from where you ended on the point tracker on the board. You'll get points for dogs with final scoring abilities. You'll get the breed expert awards. Oh, and then a completed objective card. So everyone has an, a, a secret objective card. So you'll get points for that if you completed their standard objectives and then expert objectives. So depending on which objective you completed, you'll get a point. Oh, sorry, they're right here. So like, for example, an experienced one is four of a kind. During final scoring, gain seven points if you have at least four dogs of one breed category in your kennel. And you can only score objectives once. Um, and then in addition to that, you will get... Uh, for every five remaining sources, you'll get one point um, resources. And but again, you can place resources on dogs before you do this because um, resources placed on dogs will not count towards this. And then you get your total. So that is Dog Park. And again, it comes with really amazing components. I absolutely love the components in the scheme and the colors in the scheme. They are so vibrant and just really, really beautiful. And the collector's edition comes with extra dog tokens that you can choose from. Uh, so you can decide which one you want your point marker to be. So like for example, for yellow, you can choose between these two dogs. They're so pretty. But yeah, there's like a bunch of different dogs that you can choose from if you have the collector's edition. But yeah, it is a really pretty game with super pretty colors. I just really, really love it. Um, the bird, by the way, is a round tracker in case you're wondering what the bird was used for. Um, so yeah, so I guess that is it. Um, and these are just some special tokens that you place out during the uh, beginning of the round during the forecast when, or the park card when you, uh, the location bonus, sorry, uh, when you decide which places get some location bonuses. And here are the component holders. Um, so yeah, so I actually ended up putting the leash tokens in these component holders because um, that I guess that's where they go before I had them in a bag, which didn't really make sense. Um, so yeah, so that was the one game I played. People have commented that it's like wingspan for dogs. But with dogs, um, I've never played Wingspan, so I would not know if that's true or not, but I really, really enjoyed this game and I would happily play this again. It's by no means a difficult game. It's pretty um, simple, but a really, really good game. Sorry, let me just figure out where that score pad goes. Okay, there we go. So yeah, if you can get your hands on Dog Park, I highly recommend it. It's like a, you know, a medium, a lightweight to medium game that's a lot of fun to play. Um, and it's just got really beautiful, pretty artwork of dogs and just really, you know, amazing components. It's just a nice, fun game. So yeah. And going around when you're walking around the park, like, you know, everyone will have a chance in a four player game to be the first player. So, you know, if there is a first player advantage in walking around the park, everyone will have a chance to get that first player advantage. Um, so, you know, I don't think that it's highly in, in unbalanced in any way. So that was the one game I played. So let's go on to games that I am backing. So yeah, I guess I'll go on to games that I'm backing. So I'm currently at the $1 pledge level for Redwood. Redwood is a game, um, I backed their last game, Tiwanaku or something like that. I think that's what it was called. So it's, um. Uh, who's the publisher for this game? Sit Down. Sit Down is the publisher. They're like a Belgian publisher. It's like a really pretty game with like really pretty animal components and nice miniatures. But you know, I actually watched a review of this game and they were like, yeah, it's got amazing components, but maybe the gameplay isn't that great. So I'm just backing it at the $1 level, uh, 1 euro level, um, because I haven't really decided. Chances are I'm actually not going to back this, but for now I'm just at the 1 euro level for that. Um, 
if you're backing it, let me know what you think about it. Um, you know, I think with the cost of living so high these days, I think pe a lot of people are being really careful about what they back. I am backing Dreadful Meadows at the $1 level um, so that I can get my production copy of it. I was super excited for this campaign, so I was sitting there ready to hit the refresh button so I could get backer number one. I've always wanted to get backer number one on a campaign. I got backer number two. I've gotten backer number two before, so that is still the lowest backer number I've ever gotten on a campaign. The other campaign for which I got backer number two was Adventures in Neverland, which is a game I don't even want anymore. And I've emailed the publisher like three times to see if I can get a refund and they are just ignoring my messages. <laughs> so I, I'm guessing I won't get a refund. I'll just get the game whenever they do decide to ship it out. It's, you know, that campaign was in 2020. So it's like long overdue. Um, but yeah, I had backer number two for Adventures in Neverland and now backer number two for Dreadful Meadows, which is sad. I really wanted backer number one. But yeah, um, I'm really excited. Even though I have a really nice pre-production copy of it, I'm super excited for the production copy of Dreadful Meadows because it'll come with the expansion. Um, so yeah, so I really, really can't wait for that. I'm backing Race to the Raft, which is by Frank West, um, you know, Isle of Cats designer. So I'm backing that at one pound. Um, I'm backing Canvas, the final expansion to Canvas, um, the deluxe edition. So I'm backing that because I love Canvas. I think it's such a fun game. Uh, it's a very, for me, a thinky game and um, I just love making the art pieces and sometimes you end up maybe focusing more on the art than actually the scoring. Actually, I wouldn't say that's true. Actually, when I play the game, I think I actually try to score high, but I just really suck at it and I still end up losing miserably and then I'm, you know, stuck with art pieces that I maybe didn't really want. But I do sometimes try to pick cards that I think are prettier than the others. But yeah, I really suck at Canvas, but I'm super excited for the final expansion to this game. And then, um, of course, I'm backing Life of the Amazonia at $1. I'm backing Wonderland's War, Shards of, Shards of Madness, the expansion, even though I haven't played the base game yet um, because the base game was gifted to me. And so I figured I might as well just get the expansion just in case I end up loving this game. Who knows? Um, still haven't played it, though. And of course, I'm backing Heisen Hyperspace uh, at $2 to get my production copy if it funds, which I'm not sure it will. Um, it's got 12 days left, but it's only at 3000 roughly $300, and they need $5,600. Um, Skull, actually, the designer of Skull canceled the campaign for Skull since that was not funding, and he'll try to relaunch that at another time. And of course, I'm backing Leaf, which of course, you know, funded on day one, and Mind Your Business has finally funded, and I'm still at the $22 level for that, so I can just get one box. Um, you know, I might cancel my pledge for that. I don't know, um, depending on how I feel financially wise. Um, right now it's got five days to go. Um, and since it has funded, I feel like maybe I can get a copy of it someday in the future. So I might cancel my pledge for it. I don't know. I think that there might be some Kickstarter exclusives, but I don't know. Let me check. I don't actually know if there is a Kickstarter exclusive. I think like the Kickstarter exclusive is like, uh, an enamel pin, if I remember correctly, or something like that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we'll see about that. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I still have some time to decide. So yeah, so those are the games that I'm currently backing. So let's go on to games that I have received. I have two to show you. So the first one I'm super excited about is Cosmoctopus. So I'm going to be covering this for its Kickstarter. It launches next week, but um, I think they want me to release a mid-campaign video for this, which is fine since I would like to play this again. I actually played this at UKGE and really loved it. So I really wanted to cover it for its Kickstarter. So this is designed by Henry Audubon and it's being published by Paper Fort Games and it's for one to four players. I seriously enjoy this. It's a really good uh, engine building game. So let me just show you some of the components. So here are some tentacles which you are trying to collect in order to win this game, if I remember correctly. So some tentacle components. Um, it's got different kinds of resources in it. You're basically going to be making a map of some sort. Oh. That's funny, there's pins in here. We love Cosmo. Hmm. <laughs> Just some button pins, which I'm not a huge fan of button pins. I guess I'm a bit of a pin snob, <laughs> but, but there are some pins in here. Um, 
but yeah, I, I suppose I'm a pin snob. Um, so let's see. Let me just show you some cards. Okay, so here you are going to have the different locations that you will be moving the octopus to in order to take various actions. So here are the different location tiles and you have different configurations that you can make. So you will be able to make different configurations which will determine like where you can move the octopus and what resources or actions you'll be able to take. Um, you know, I'm doing all of this based on memory right now because I played this back in May, uh, no sorry, June, early June at UKGE. Um, so there's different kinds of resources in this game. So let me just hold up some of the resources. And again, it's an engine building game. Um, I don't remember what, like maybe that's the center of the universe. I don't really remember. Um, so let me just show you some cards. So yeah, you're collecting like different kinds of cards and different cards will allow you to like, you know, of course do different things, get kind of different kinds of resources. Like you need, I believe if I remember correctly, you need to pay the resources shown in the corner in order to then do the bottom action, if I remember correctly. So like, for example, I think you would need five ink tokens and one of the gray ones in order to get three red uh, speech bubbles or whatever those are. Um, if I remember correctly, I believe that's how it works. But yeah, I just really like the look of this game. Like the aesthetic of this game is really nice too. I just really, really like the aesthetic of it. Um, yeah, and it was a really fun game. So when I was at PAX Unplugged, I, uh, not PAX, sorry, UKGE, I played a four player game of it. We did not finish the game, but we got pretty close to the end. Um, yeah. So you're like devotees of this like cosmoctopus, this like special octopus in space. <laughs> and I guess you are trying to, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to collect tentacles to like please him or something like that? Um, so what does it say? So it says for millennia, elders have spoken of a powerful celestial octopod who inhabits the Il Il inky realm, a dimension connecting the deepest gloom of the sea to the dark abyss of space. Some call this creature Cosmoctopus, others know it as the great inky one. On every continent, dedicated groups of devotees are striving to understand the being's intentions in a bid to harness its power. Some followers study books of lore filled with strange symbols and numbers, toiling to glean the secrets encrypted within and examine arcane relics unearthed from distant corners of the globe. Others gaze into the night sky, yearning to find unusual astrono astronomical patterns or listen intently for whispered tale tales audible to only the most devoted subjects. Do you have what it takes to join us? Um, so if you're interested in learning more, I don't know if you can actually do a, one of those scan codes through a video, but there you go. <laughs> if you want to scan that, I don't know if you can. Um, so yeah, maybe I can take a picture of it and post it, but I'm sure that they already have a preview page up. I mean, it's only a couple of days. By the time you see this video, it's going to be like two days before it launches, I think. I think it launches early next week. Um, yeah, so that is Cosmoctopus, which I'm really looking forward to checking out again <laughs> and making a video for. Um, so yeah, so that arrived, which I'm super excited about. And then another game, which was a complete surprise because um, this publisher tends to send me games and I don't even realize they're sending me games. Um, so let me show you. So I received this game called Monolith from Simon Games. Um, so Monolith is designed by Phil Walker Harding and it is for one to four players. Um, so it looks like it's like a stone stacking game of some kind. So I actually unboxed it because um, it seems like, you know, it's Phil, Wa Phil Walker Harding. So I'm like, okay, I should try this one. Um, so it comes with a bunch of, it has this one main board. And I think depending on player account, you decide which side you want to use. And then it comes with so many different blocks and different colors and different shapes. So there's three, five different colors. So there's like this aqua color, this blue color, like this dark gray charcoal one, orange, and then beige. And it comes with, so each player gets a player board. And they are all, they're all different, I think. So like this one 
has like orange on so like if I line them up so orange is at the top for both of them then you'll see the co other colors are different on the different sides um, so each player will have a different starting tile board I think you have to build on top of these maybe and then but there are even though it's a four player game there's five to choose from so there will be variability um, and then there are these like tokens of some kind and more tokens of some kind and then there are some cards um, so obviously I haven't played this so I don't know what it's like it just arrived a couple of days ago and I haven't had a chance to play it but uh, you know again I think he's the one who designed that one llama game I have um, I think I might have gotten rid of it already but um, I think he designed that as well which I liked I don't remember the name of it now but maybe you know what I'm talking about so yeah so I'm excited to actually try this one out um, you know, Simon has kind of been um, hit and miss for me, mostly miss. <laughs> so, so let's see what this one is like. Um, yeah. So I will try this one and let you guys know. Hopefully, I will get to play it soon. I hope. So yeah, I actually when I tried looking this up on BGG, it didn't even have an entry yet, from what I could tell. So yeah. So don't know much about it besides what I can tell you. Oh, okay, I, I guess I can read the back for you. So monolith, giant stones of perfect shape. Monoliths have been studied by many looking to unlock their true meaning. As a monolith builder, it's up to you to build your structure faster than the rest, making prophecies and achieving goals as you build. In the end, only one can be the monolith master. So you're going to pick a stone, build your monolith, and then make prophecies and complete levels to score the most points. Hmm. Well, here's the back of the box. So yeah, so that is Monolith. So that arrived. And I think that's it. Um, in terms of Colleen, I'm still, you know, waiting on Colleen games. So let's move on. So I did not get any new questions on uh, YouTube, but someone had recently asked me a question on Twitter in a private message. Um, and I actually answered this person in private message already, but then I thought it might be a good idea to discuss it in a video. Um, so they asked me, um, I was wondering what you think of Tabriz. So as you guys might know, um, Tabriz is a game that is coming out on GameFound, I think, or maybe Kickstarter next week, I think, um, designed by Randy Flynn, the designer of Cascadia. So I already told this person that I will not be backing the game and I will explain why. <laughs> so, um, so let me first give a little bit of a brief uh, background on what is happening in Iran in case a lot of people don't know. Um, I don't know how much of the media is reporting on Iran. So, you know, again, if politics and uh, board game drama are not your thing, just feel free to skip this whole section because as you know, I put timestamps in the description. Um, so just feel free to just skip all of this if you don't want to hear me. And I may sound like a broken record at times because I am going to talk about why I'm not backing the game. And that has to do mostly with stuff that happened previously and the designer. So first let's talk about Iran. So Iran, so before we begin, um, again, as people may or may not know, I do have ethnic and cultural ties to the country as well as religious ties. I am a Shia Muslim. So Shias are found in Iran, prim well, predominantly in Iran, in Iraq, Lebanon, and to a lesser extent in Pakistan, Bahrain, um, and other countries, but in India, but primarily in Iran and Iraq, um, so in Lebanon. So yeah, so I'm Shia, so I am a minority in the, even in the Muslim community worldwide. Um, and Shias, um, so Iran is a Shia country. It is based on Itna Shari Shiism, which is what I am, a 12er Shia. We are the majority of Shias. Um, so Shias and Sunnis are the two main branches of Islam. And then you have 12er, under Shiism, you have 12ers and then a couple of other uh, sects within Shiism as you do within Sunni Islam. So you have different various sects within Sunni Islam. But 12er Shias are the main Shia branch. Um, and that is the basis of Iran's government, Valayat al -Fuki. So in case people don't know, um, in addition to having ethnic and cultural and religious ties to Iran, I am, um, I actually, before law school, I had started doing a PhD in Middle Eastern studies with a focus on Iran and Turkey, actually. Um, so I also did study the Palestinian, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict though again i don't like the word conflict but that's what we'll just call it for now um so you know i have studied this at a graduate level so it's not like i'm just you know 
talking shit that I don't know about. <laughs> okay, and prior to even going to grad school, um, because I was born Shia, I did not want to be Shia simply because I was born Shia. So actually, when I was an undergrad in college, is when I really started to read a lot of books about the Middle East, about Islam, and studied a lot of Islamic books written by Islamic scholars that. If I mention their names, you wouldn't even know who they are because, um, you know, it's only Muslims who would really, Shia Muslims who would know who these scholars are. And I had read a shit ton of books about Shiism because I wanted to be Shia because it's something that I believe in, not because um, I was born into it. And after having studied the faith for a very, very long time um, and reading a lot of books, I d had decided that, yes, I'm Shia. I'm not the you know most religious of people nowadays, um, but back then I was pretty religious. So back in college, I was pretty religious. And back then I had actually even wanted to go to Iran to study in a Hausa, which is like a religious school. I had actually asked my mother if I could do that when I was in college. I've since then changed a lot. Um, you know, at, I won't get into what my religious beliefs are now. I'm still, I still consider myself a Shia um, and I still consider myself spiritual and I still believe in a lot of the tenets of the faith, but I'm not going to go into, you know, how religious I am or, or anything like that. Um, so I have studied the history of Iran, of course, um, since I, you know, did do that at a graduate level and wrote my thesis on the Iranian government. So the Iranian government is a religious government. It's a theocracy. Um, so in Islam, there is supposed to be no compulsion in religion. The Quran even says that there is supposed to be no compulsion in religion. So the mere fact that you have a government that is forcing its citizens, even the non-Muslim ones, to wear hijab, to wear a headscarf rather, I won't say hijab, and I'll go into why I won't say hijab, but the proper term is headscarf, um, is wrong. You're not supposed to force anyone to do something that, you know, is a, a belief in the religion and if someone doesn't believe in that you're not supposed to force them to do it there's supposed to be no compulsion in religion however um the iranian government believes that you know it's doing what it's doing for the good of the world the good of society because it's going to um lead to the messiah making an appearance um so again that's all religious you know belief and i won't go into that however like with any government you know there is a lot of corruption and the way in which they have you know instituted their theocracy is corrupt and you know there's a lot of corruption there's a lot of abuse of power there's a lot of you know killings there's a lot of really bad stuff that happens just in a lot of areas in the world and a lot of places in the world so i for one do not support a theocracy i don't support what the government is doing to its people i don't support the killing of innocent people i don't support a morality police um you know the morality police i would say is pretty um inconsistent um over time like when i went when I was last in Iran, which was in 2004. Since then, I've had a few trips fall through, unfortunately, but I do hope that I will get to return someday. But um, I was there in 2004, and I guess I'll just pop up a couple of pictures here from when I was there. And as you can see in the photos, I would like have most of my hair in the front showing. I would I was feeling really hot because I was there in July, so I even didn't have my neck covered, which you're supposed to have covered. Um, so I would have like the scarf like completely open in the front with most of my hair showing in the you know in the front. And not once did I get stopped by morality police. Um, not once. You know, never had anyone say anything to me. Of course, when I would be in the more uh, religiously observant cities like Meshad or Qum, then of course I would observe more strict, proper, you know, hijab. I would wear the scarf more properly um, out of respect for being in those holy cities, um, which are holy sites for Shia Muslims. Um, and I did make like, um, you know, a visit to a shrine in Meshad in Qum when I was there. Um, so yeah, so let's see, where am I going with this? So I don't agree with what Iran is doing. I think it's a, you know, it's terrible for the Iranian people. It's very sad. It's, you know, people are being killed. People are being imprisoned and tortured for voicing their, you know, discontentment with the government, the government officials, a lot of them are just complete hypocrites. You know, it's one set of rules for the Iranian citizens and then another set of rules for their own families who, you know, they'll send their daughters to Europe and their daughters can do whatever they want, which people should be able to do whatever they want. Like, even if I don't agree with your lifestyle, do whatever the hell you want. It's no one's business, right? So no one should be able to control how anyone else lives their life. But unfortunately, you know, you have a lot of officials in the Iranian government who are completely corrupt and um, are total hypocrites. Um, 
So I don't think, you know, I don't support the Iranian government um, in that sense. You know, I'm, I'm someone who gets defensive of Middle Eastern nations, not just Iran, whenever they are like criticized by other nations, because I'm always like, well, look at you, you're a hypocrite. Like, look at your country, look what your country does. So I get defensive of nations in that way, but I also don't approve of what countries in the West are doing. So when I call out hypocrisy, it's not because I'm actually defending the actions of the Middle Eastern nations because I don't support what they're doing. It's because I just want to point out people's hypocrisy and make them realize that no nation on this planet is perfect, especially not nations in the West who have interfered in other governments. So I don't know how many of you know about the history of Iran, but just a very brief history. So um, prior to it becoming a theocracy, um, you know, Iran had gone through, you know, a lot of unrest and you know the the government was not well the economy was not well i mean sorry the economy was not doing well you had the shah on power who was just completely corrupt and so iranians had actually elected a democratically elected leader mossadegh however the british did not like that mossadegh was elected as prime minister because he wanted to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company and keep the profits for Iran so that he could better the economy, better the education, healthcare, all of these things that are important to helping the people of Iran. So he wanted to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Well, the British were not happy with that, so they, with the United States help, um, overthrew Mossadegh and elected a democratically elected leader in Iran. and reinstated the Shah in power and the Shah was extremely corrupt so the Shah yeah you know was hoarding wealth he was only benefiting him and people like him and his family and people in power and so yet again Iran was not in a great state and unfortunately the ironic thing is that when Mossadegh was elected he actually offered the British a higher percentage of profits that then they ended up getting from the Shah after the Shah was reinstated. Because due to pressure after the Shah was reinstated, the amount of profits that they then gave to the British from the Anglo-Iranian oil company was less than what Mossadegh was offering. So in the end, this coup did not even need to happen. In the end, Mossadegh did not need to be overthrown, but that's what happened due to the US and British involvement. Um, so of course you have the Shah in power who is completely, you know, corrupt and not helping the Iranian people. So that's how the Iranian revolution happened. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this book, but I will just hold it up for you. It's called Persepolis. It's a, a, a graphic novel by Marjane. I don't know how she pronounces her name. Marjane? Marjane? I don't know. Um, she's French, but Iranian. Born and raised in Iran and uh, Satrapi. So check this out. It's a graphic novel. Um, you know, it gives the first-hand account of someone who lived through the revolution and what it was like during that time. Um, so I would recommend it. I think it's, you know, a good way to learn about Iran and the revolution if you don't know anything about it. Um, so that's a brief history on what happened in Iran and how, you know, the theocracy came to be and where we are today <laughs> with a corrupt government and lots of governments are corrupt. So, um, yeah, it's really sad. And I, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's been years since I've like really studied it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have any suggestions or, you know, I'm not an expert on government or anything like that, though, you know, that is what a, the Iranian government is what I had done my thesis on and everything. But, you know, I, I don't have any recommendations. I can admit like when I'm, you know, not the most well versed in something or uneducated in something, but, you know, that's how it is. So I hope that, you know, things get better in Iran and I hope that people will get the freedom that they desire. I hope, you know, that the you know economy gets better um i will say that once the um uh the um once the shah was overthrown and the uh theocracy was started once khomeini came into power I, things actually did improve at first like people just want to paint the theocracy in a completely negative light and I think that's unfair as well. So when Khomeini came into power, a lot of things improved, education improved. More and more women were be attending university and becoming educated. And to this day, there are more highly uh, university educated women in Iran than there are men, in fact. Um, healthcare improved, the infant mortality rate decreased, literacy improved, lots of things actually improved in Iran once 
the theocracy uh, began. However, you know, as with any government, uh, their power corrupts, and now we have a corrupt government with lots of corrupt officials, and things need to change. And of course, um, you know, there are religious minorities in Iran who are persecuted. The um, God, what what are the Baha'i population? Um, one of my best friends actually is Baha'i. So, and my little sister, who uh, her roommate is Baha'i, and uh, she, you know, we every time I go visit her, we. Um, interact and you know I've attended Baha'i functions I've attended the religious functions um, I've you know spoken at length with Baha'i people they are very kind they are a really you know just amazing group of people I've never met a Baha'i who I don't like yet so um, you know that's I think says something they're just very open very loving just really really kind people and you know they deserve to be able to practice their religion freely so and Zoroastrians and anyone you know who lives in Iran should be able to practice their religion freely. I won't talk much about the Ottoman Empire, but um, which I also did study in grad school, um, but they had the system called the Millet system, which was very successful. So when the Ottomans ruled, which was a Muslim empire, they allowed Jews and Christians to have their own courts, which they could adjudicate their own matters in, and that's called the Millet system. And I believe, you know, it was very successful. And I do think that other nations should, you know, maybe look to that as an example. I mean, I know things today are complicated. You know, so many people are anti-religion in general. So, so you know, and, you know, religion can compete with basic human rights. Um, so I don't know if that would work today. But, you know, if if Iran really wanted a true Islamic government, one that is following Islam properly, then it would allow people to practice their religion freely because there is supposed to be no compulsion in religion, but it's not doing that. So um, that's, you know, another problem with Iran. But so my reason for not backing Tabriz. So last year when, you know, back in 2021, when, um, you know, Israel was... Um, as usual, you know, but tensions were heightened and the conflict was heightened when, you know, Israel was attacking Palestinians. And back at that time, I had been told I would be reviewing a game from Burnt Island Games for their Kickstarter campaign. And then it turned out that Helena Kappel, a Zionist, and didn't want to send me the game anymore because she thought I was strong arming Eric Lang into making anti Zionist statements, which is not true. Um, I'll link videos below in which I've discussed this in detail. <laughs> so, but before, because I know people love to accuse me of making everything about myself, this is not me making things about myself. Anytime I've been accused of making things about myself, it's me pointing out the industry's hypocrisy and double standards. That is not me making it about myself. That is me pointing out how people in this industry who love to claim that they are all about diversity and inclusivity but then behave in a shitty manner when it comes towards you know to me or to Muslims or issues that a Muslim would care about um, that's not me making things about myself that's just me pointing out people's hypocrisy and double standards in this industry so um, Randy Flynn I was friends with him on Facebook and then he unfriended me when all of this happened so when I called out Helena for being a Zionist and called her out for her bigotry um, you know and I want to just briefly say again like you, the audio is there to listen to it's when if I ever listen to it it's hard for me to listen to because you know when you are in the heat of the moment there are things that you want to say but you can't eloquently say them and there are so many things that i could have said better and i could have really gotten to basically show even better that yes the reason that she is not wanting me to review a game is because she is Zionist. but on you know multiple occasions during the conversation she did say that she could not state what the difference between blm black lives matter and palestinian lives matter is because she accused me of yelling at eric lang which i never did and i've you know posted proof of that before as well in um other videos so again i can link those below but not once did i yell at eric lang or anyone else i would very calmly state my position about palestine and what my beliefs are and how i think the industry is just you know behaving badly when it comes to talking about israel and palestine and what's going on there or simply not caring and just being total hypocrites and about it so randy flynn 
you know, is someone who unfriended me due to industry pressure, I would assume. I mean, I don't know for a fact because, you know, people don't message me and tell me why they're unfriending me. I mean, one person did and she, who unfriended me. Um, she messaged me and said she was being pressured to unfriend me. So she did. Um, and she told me that that's why. Um, and so now we're not friends because obviously I'm not going to be friends with a coward. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so um, Randy Flynn unfriended me and unfollowed me everywhere because I was outspoken about the Palestine conflict, because I was outspoken about industry's double standards, about how everyone who claims to be about human rights does not care about the Palestine issue. And here they are supporting a Zionist publisher. I would like to ask you guys, what is the difference between Iran and Israel? I'll tell you, there is no difference really. So Israel is a state that is a Zionist state and believes that you know, the state belongs to Jewish people. And uh, as a result, they've been exterminating Palestinians, forcefully removing them from their homes, bulldozing their homes, uh, you know, taking over Palestinian homes, creating settlements for Israelis. And it's an apartheid state. And Palestinians, uh, the people, the indigenous people of Palestine are being treated like termites, like pests, like pests that need to be exterminated. They are not given the rights they deserve. They are killed. They are killed for voicing their opinions. Um, the same thing is happening in Iran right now. So you tell me what is the difference between Iran and the Zionist government? There is no difference in the way that they are treating the people. And in fact, I would go as far as to say that the Zionist government is worse than the Iranian government um, in the way that they treat the Palestinians. But you do not see the outpouring of support for the Palestinians that you see for the Iranian people. So Randy Flynn has been posting a lot recently about what's happening in Iran and showing his support for Iran. I know that he lived in Iran as a child because we talked about it when we were friends on Facebook. We even talked about his game Tabriz, which I was super excited to play at one time. You know, I've never played it, but when we were friends on Facebook, I expressed my excitement and he expressed his um, excitement and having someone who's actually from, who's ethnically and culturally from the region of the religion playing his game. But now, of course, um, since he unfriended me and unfollowed me due to me being so dangerous or whatever, um, naturally, I've never been approached to play this game or give my thoughts on it or make a one minute video for it. And so all these people who claim to be about diversity, I'm sorry, I would like to know who is more diverse than me in this industry, being a Shia female content creator. So I know that's going to get me a lot of shit for saying that, but I mean, seriously, um, there are hardly any Muslim content creators to begin with. The other few Muslim content creators that exist in this industry are male. And um, since the beginning, since even before I was involved in any kind of controversy, they basically shunned me because a lot of Muslim men are misogynistic and to see a female Muslim, you know, becoming a content creator and putting herself on camera, these Muslim content creators wanted to have nothing to do with me. I'd made efforts at, you know, talking with them and trying to befriend them, but they've done nothing but basically belittle me and insult me and just ostracize me. So I have no allies, uh, diverse allies in this industry, which is the truth. Um, East Asians, there are a number of East Asian content creators. There's like a decent sized group of them. Of course, they're still a minority, but there's a decent sized group of them, as well as black content creators. There's a decent sized group of them now. Um, there may not have been at one point in time, but now there are a decent, you know, there's more of them than there are of me. You have Our Family play game, Plays Games, you have Black Board Gaming, you have the Black Couple in Tantrum House. So there are still more of them than there are of me. As far as I know, I am the only Shia Muslim content creator. Yet, despite being connected to Iran, I was not approached to cover the game, um, naturally, because I'm so dangerous for having voiced my opinions about uh, Israel. So I think Randy Flynn is a hypocrite. So on the one hand, if you unfriend someone because they are voicing their um, opinions about Israel and claiming, you know, that this person is dangerous for doing so because apparently I'm dangerous because I voiced my concerns and as a result some outside third party supposedly made a death threat on Helena Kappel which I had nothing to do with. So that makes me dangerous because of course I have control over the actions of third parties. No, it's completely illogical, it's unreasonable, it has, it makes no sense but I was labeled as dangerous, I was labeled as difficult which again in previous videos I've talked about how when Zoe was, you know, treated badly by Tabletop Simulator, the mods in the Discord, and 
TTS mod started calling her difficult, all of a sudden, all the people who used to call me difficult and dangerous were saying, oh, see, TTS mods are only calling her difficult to silence her. Well, that is exactly what was done to me when I basically said Helena Kappel now doesn't want to send me a game to review because she's Zionist. Everyone called me difficult and said all I was doing was setting up to burn bridges. So again, certain language that, you know, was applied to one person wrong, but when applied to me perfectly fine. These people are complete hypocrites and actually don't give a shit about diversity and cannot recognize their own implicit biases against Muslims. So I don't understand how someone who could unfriend me for speaking up about the Palestin Palestinian conflict is now posting nonstop about Iran as, as though he suddenly cares about human rights in the Middle East. And I understand that not everyone will care about every human rights issue in the world. I understand there is a lot of shit going on in this world, right? But the fact that someone unfriended me because I was vocal about something, a human rights issue in the Middle East, and is now being very vocal about what's happening in Iran, and I don't give a shit that he lived there when he was a child, I still think it's hypocritical to do that. Um, and I think it's cowardly. And I, you know, and as a result, he didn't approach me to review his game, though years ago he had promised that I would be one of the people to do so because of my ties to Iran, of course, a game, you know, a country which he's now going to profit from, from for this game that he's created about about it. Um, you know, I would love to know whether he donates any of his profits to the Iranian cause for, you know, fight for freedom, because if he doesn't, then you're just profiting off of a culture that you don't belong to and you only lived in this country for a few years when you were a child and I think that must have been a very long time ago given how old he appears to be so I think you know I think it's all just bullshit and you know I'm just like fuck that like I think it's just nonsense and goes against what all of these people claim to preach about being all about diversity and inclusivity except for when it comes to Muslims um, because you know they I think Muslims are complicated for them because a lot of these people who are preaching diversity and inclusivity are anti-religion. So when you have a population in the world who is a marginalized community because of their, you know, religious status, which for many Muslims, Islam is not just a religion, but a way of life. It causes like this internal conflict in these people who on the one hand claim that they're all about diversity and inclusivity, but then on the other hand, hate religion and deep down inside hate Islam because they view it to be a transphobic, a homophobic religion. And, you know, it's hard for them to admit that that's what they believe, but it's true. And that's why repeatedly I've been called a TERF, a trans exclusionary radical feminist, because people think I'm transphobic, which I'm not. And it doesn't matter that I have, you know, actually literally volunteered my time to help trans people legally change their names, something that I absolutely did not have to do. Um, but somehow I'm still transphobic because, you know, I'm Muslim. So these people will just not acknowledge their implicit biases against Muslims. And, um, you know, I've mentioned this on my channel before, but I think it's complete bullshit that Our Family Plays Games, who's all about Black Lives Matter, continues to be sponsored by a Zionist publisher, Burnt Island Games and Kids Table Board Gaming. Um, because Zionism is, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement spoke out in support of Palestinians. PLM and BLM are essentially the same thing. So, you know, if you are a black person in America and you are getting sponsored by a Zionist publisher, like I personally, I think that shows a lack of integrity and Our Family Plays Games has done nothing but like absolutely shitty tweets made about me on Twitter. And I think that's in very poor taste, like, you know, sure you hate me because I called out your, you know, sponsor, but how about instead of hating me for doing that, you actually educate yourselves on what Zionism is and what your sponsor publisher supports. And, you know, Helena Kappel on her Facebook profile had, you know, made her Facebook image in support of the indigenous kids in Canada who were killed. Yeah, apparently Palestinian babies being killed in Palestine is complicated. Um, these issues are not complicated and if you were to say black lives matter is complicated i think you would get called out on that right so by the same people who preach diversity and inclusivity so there again is just so much uh hypocrisy and double standards in this industry and these people will just never admit their own implicit biases against muslims and people who identify as muslim 
And so since Randy Flynn is a, clearly a part of that group, since he unfriended me and uh, unfollowed me everywhere because of that whole Palestine thing last year, and I've not been once been once approached to, you know, cover the scheme, which, you know, I'm, as far as I know, I'm the only content creator actually tied to Iran. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to support his game. And in fact, I've, you know, as they say, uh, success is the best revenge. So I will design my own game about Iran and I think it will hopefully be better since I actually have ties to the region and I already have a lot of ideas in my, in my mind and I've actually already started outlining, um, my plans for a game that is about Iran, but I won't say any more about what that is. Um, so now I have three games in the works, um, but that is why I will not be supporting Tabriz. Um, I think, you know, I think it's in poor taste that the publisher and designer would not reach out to the only, you know, person who's actually tied to the country that this game is about to cover it. Um, so not that I feel I'm entitled to anything, because I know that's what people are going to say. They claimed I felt I was entitled to cover um, the, f the fall of the Mountain King, um, which was the game that caused that whole controversy. No, I didn't feel I was entitled to it. I was told I would be covering it. And then it became more about than just covering a game. It wasn't in the end about me covering a game. In the end, it was about people claiming to be about human rights and diversity and inclusivity, but then absolutely not being about that. And since then, all those people who claimed that they were pro-Palestinian and were trying to shut me down so that they could support their Zionist publisher, since then, they have not uttered a peep in support of Palestine, not once. Like I have checked their, you know, Twitter profiles when last time there was, a, you know, again, a very uh, intense period of um, Israelis attacking Palestinians, not a peep from these people who supposedly are super pro-Palestinian. So, you know, people's agendas are actually very clear. And if you have, you know, the skills of inference and deduction, then you can figure it out. It's really not that hard to figure out what people are all about. Um, so yeah, so I will not be supporting Tabriz, but if my friends do, I honestly don't care. I'm not going to be one of those people who's like, oh, you shouldn't support the scheme. You shouldn't back the scheme because this designer is an asshole um, or this publishing company is an asshole. Like people just want to play their games and enjoy their games. So at the end of the day, if that's what people want to do, I don't care. Like, you know, I myself am working on trying to separate my feelings about certain designers and publishers from the games themselves so that hopefully I can enjoy the games because at the end of the day, I just want to be able to enjoy games as well. Like, you know, I am someone who would be actually happy to keep politics and gaming separate, but you know, if people are going to be such effing hypocrites about it, then I will point it out and I will make a fuss about it because I think that's just bullshit. So, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm not going to make a fuss if people want to back to breeze or play it, whatever. But someday I hope that you will play my game about Iran when I actually make and publish that game. So anyway, so that's my little spiel on Iran. I know I go off tangents a lot and um, I probably haven't even covered all the points that I wanted to cover, but such is the case when you just speak off the cuff to a camera and don't really have an outline prepared or notes you know this isn't a court case so i'm usually unprepared when i do these long talks in front of the camera and usually later on i'll be like oh i wish i'd said this or i wish i didn't say that in that way you know things always come up later which i realize that you know things could have been stated more eloquently or persuasively but oh well um so yeah so wrapping up, um, next week there probably will not be a video because it is Halloween weekend and I'm going to New York City. Um, so I'm going to be hanging out with uh, two of my board gaming friends and my sisters as well. So um, this one other content creator, uh, Midnight Board Gaming, who is from Mexico, she and her husband are now good friends of mine and we met up last year for Halloween weekend in Universal Studios and Disney World and we had the best weekend ever. It was like seriously the most epic Halloween weekend ever. So I'm going to be seeing them this Halloween weekend in New York City. So I will be leaving Friday, early Friday and returning on Sunday. So there will likely not be a weekly playback video next week. And then um, the week and after I believe is my last free weekend before I move. So the weekend of November 5th is my last weekend in this apartment. And then November 12th is my move-in date. So that's kind of scary because I am not even 25% packed. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think I'm gonna go into panic mode pretty soon. Um, 
but I will try to shoot a video that weekend, the you know, November 4th, I will try to shoot a video then so that I can have one up. But then obviously the next weekend, you're not gonna get a video most likely because I'm going to be busy um, packing and, you know, moving. <laughs> but hopefully you'll get a video the following weekend then in my new place and in my new studio. Um, I should actually place an order for the table that I am planning on ordering for my game room so that it will arrive in time. I should do that. I think I'll do that today. Um, so I will leave a question for you guys. So with Halloween around the corner, um, tell me what your Halloween plans are. So like I said, I'll be in Halloween in Halloween. I'll be in New York City the weekend of Halloween, but then I'll be back um, for Halloween day. So I don't get any trick-or-treaters where I live and I think it's going to be a bit hard for me to organize a Halloween game night as I've done in the past. I'll see if people want to do that. If not, I'll probably see if one of my friends wants some company just handing out candy to trick-or-treaters. I don't know. Um, so I'll see. But yeah, tell me what your Halloween plans are. And I guess that is it. So I guess I'll see you guys in two weeks then. And hopefully I will have more games to talk about then since I hope by then I'll have played Bestiary of Sigilum since I have to prepare a video for that campaign. Hopefully I'll have played Cosmoctopus again as well as uh, Flamecraft because uh, Flame um, I did sleeve the cards in the end. Even the big location cards, I ended up sleeving those. Um, I had sleeves on hand that fit them. Um, so yeah, so I guess that's it. So until next time, bye!